where Fred actually did depart Wednesday and arrived on Thursday into Kenya. Here are some pictures of him actually going hard at work. Right? Got a smile on his face. This is, in fact, if I got this right, this is the widow's house that those of us collected money, donated money, made the offering. This is what was built, folks. This is your gifts at work. Amen to that, right? Now, what's really funny about this, and it really doesn't come through in the pictures, is that although Fred arrived on Thursday, his bags got there yesterday. <laughs> So, my name is Matt. Um, I'm fuzzy. Something's going with I won't move it. We'll put it up here. All right. Um, so, I'm, you guys see me play music. Um, I, I like to uh, play guitar and sing with you guys, but today I get the pleasure of delivering a, a word of encouragement uh, and a, a word of hope. To you guys. Uh, so first we'll start with the video and I'll, I'll roll the TV over while you do that. Maybe. Still did it. We're having some technical difficulties. Mr. Rogers, um, and we'll go through some interesting facts about Mr. Rogers. I'll turn this on so you can cast to it, and we might have to blank the screen for a minute. Um, but Mr. Rogers, uh, show of hands, how many people have seen Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? <laughs> Pretty much what I expected, everyone uh, but Addie. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and that's because... Uh, he was on for quite a long time, uh, until actually 2001. Uh, so uh, we'll go through some of that. But 
Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers was his name, uh, was a man of great dignity and character. Uh, today, uh, people would say um, that he would be, um, is it not going to work, Colin? You got to go to desktop, but it's okay. We just won't use the TV. Um, so he is a man that um, got into TV. Let's start with some facts. Um, he debuted the show on February 19th, 1968. And uh, another interesting fact is many of the sweaters that he wore were actually made by hand from his mother. Yeah. Um, he was actually an ordained minister. Not many people would know that. Um, but he was a Presbyterian minister. He got his uh, Bachelor in Divinity. Um, and he wanted to contribute to children's tele tele television programs because that was his passion. His passion was for uh, bringing joy to children's lives. Um, other facts, the reason why he started doing the show, uh, he saw something horrible on TV, which was actually people throwing pies at each other's face today. It probably would be much worse than he would ever imagine of some of the things that our kids get exposed to on TV. But he stated, I went to television because I hated it so, and I thought there was some way of using this fabulous instrument to be of nurture to those who would watch and listen. Adults and children watched him as the years went on. Um, he was, I did include this as a, because many people think he was perfect. Well, he wasn't perfect. Jesus is the only one that was perfect. Uh, he was a vegetarian. That's not what's bad. He didn't smoke or drink. Um, he didn't have any vices. Um, he also married the same woman, and they stayed together for 47 years. Uh, the only thing that would be scandalous is he liked to swim uh, laps at wherever he could in uh, nude. <laughs> so now you have that image. Um, <laughs> we all have our quirks, right? Um, but the one cool thing about Mr. Rogers is he was who he was. The person that you saw on the show is the person that he was in real life. He didn't act as another character. He was the exact person that you knew and loved. Uh, the reason why I ended up going into this, the video that you watched before marked the uh, anniversary of the first filming. And Google built a, a stop motion of the introduction of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And I got this feeling of joy warm inside. And I don't know if y'all got that when you saw it. And I almost got nervous to, to actually open the book or start Googling more about Fred Rogers' life. Why? Because today, most men that are doing something like that aren't the best men of character. And it was so encouraging to actually look up and see that Fred Rogers was exactly who you knew and loved. Last fact, 895 episodes were taped of Mr. Rogers. It's one of the longer standing shows. And there's no reason why it was successful. Mr. Rogers valued silence and quiet and stillness. There was times where he would be trying to feed a fish and to listen to the fish eat, but the fish didn't eat. And he still kept the show. And he taught it about how patience was important. He used his media as a platform for all of us to learn and listen to God. And he used that to our advantage, not to his own. So what did we learn from Mr. Rogers? Well, we learned that all of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Every one of us has someone in our lives that have loved us so much and helped us grow. Not all of us might have had the best life growing up, but we still have that one person that we could attach to and say that loved us so dearly. And then one of the greatest gifts you can give anyone, and that is the gift of being your honest self. So much today in society, we, we get wrapped up in the fast pace the fast pace of trying to get things done, to be accepted by those who are around us, to give up on ourselves and become what society wants us to be. 
But Mr. Rogers was one person that always would encourage you to love yourself for exactly who you are, to love yourself for exactly who God made you. One of his quotes is, I hope that you remember, even when you're feeling blue, that is you. I like, it's you yourself. It's you, it's you I like. This is, in my opinion, coming straight from God himself through Mr. Rogers. God loves you. It's you who he likes. It's you who he encourages every day to be himself. And when you're not, he still is there on the sidelines encouraging you to turn around and be yourselves. One another one, why he did it, his quote here, one of the universal fears of childhood is that the fear of not having value in the eyes of people whom admire so much. So, Addie, I admire you, and I love you. So, how do we allow ourselves to feel special? How do we allow ourselves to be ourselves? Well, we need to forgive ourselves. We need to forgive ourselves, and we need to forgive others and get all that nastiness in the past. As Fred says, we need to put it in our rearview mirror and make it as small as we possibly can. So I've broken down the structure of forgiveness, the structure of grace. How do we do that? How do we be forgiving? How do we be grace? How do we love ourselves? Well, Fred said it himself. It actually was his professor. It's actually a quote of a quote. The only thing evil can't stand is forgiveness. Last time I spoke, we talked about a lighthouse. We talked about that light is the only thing that, that darkness can't extinguish. But the only thing evil can't stand is forgiveness. So let's break it down. If we're going to be a forgiving person, we have to trust God and make things right rather than yourself. Get out of the driver's seat. It is not your job to make things right. It is your job to let go. In Joshua 1.9, it says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever you are right now in your, in your walk, he's there. If you don't feel like he's there, that's because you're in the driver's seat. So I encourage you to slow down, as Mr. Rogers would slow down. Be quiet, be prayerful, and listen because he's there encouraging you. He's there lifting you up. Slow down and accept that you are not in control. If we were in control, I would not be here this morning because I probably would have tried to sleep in. But I don't. I let God take control, and guess what? He gets me up really early. But that's okay. I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Next one. You don't need to be right. How many of us feel like we have the desire to be right? I'll be honest, come on. If you don't, good for you. Good for you, Ben. <laughs> Lindsay's a great... You can yeah, I was going to say. Good for Lindsay. <laughs> but the reality is, we don't have to be right. It feels good to be right. It feels good to sometimes make that little bet with your, your spouse and say, I'm going to Google it and prove that I'm right. I wouldn't say that I do that, but I do. Um, but we don't have to be right. Only God is the one that's right. So in Romans 3, 23, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us does not deserve the grace that we've been given. Every one of us does not deserve the forgiveness that God gave us. And we need to remember that and be humbled by it because if we start getting into the practice of always being right, that's a quick, quick slope into exactly where we're not forgiving others, we're in a dark path, and we're not letting go and letting God love. We must die to our own desire and not have revenge. When somebody wrongs me, um, sometimes it's difficult to step back and let it go. I, I work in a um, field of information technology. 
nothing works when it's supposed to work, obviously, as we have a TV over here. Um, so it's, it's what many would call a thankless job. There'll be times where I'll get called and just berated and yelled at because their computer's not working or their phone's not working as they expected it or whatever it is, whether it was user error or was actually a problem that we caused. The one thing that my mother always taught me is water on a duck's back. If you put water on a duck's back, it slides right off. It doesn't absorb, it doesn't go inside. So I have to remind my team that every day. That yes, we're in a thankless job. Guess what, Christians, you are in a thankless job. Not, most people don't want to accept the fact that you're Christians. If they do, they want to call you a hypocrite because you fall short of the glory of God and that you sometimes slip up and fall. But the reality is we all do. And we all need to just put that drop of water on our back and let it roll right off. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to do this, you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. So when we are in our thankless job, we need to be, I would say, like a person at Chick-fil-A. My pleasure, right? Always with a smile, no matter what. Messed up an order, they're yelling at you, smile, my pleasure. They ingrain it into their minds that that's all they can say. But it's a great thing to think about. That when we're out there in life and someone wrongs us or someone did something to us that we didn't like, no matter how good or how bad it was, no matter how much it hurt us, our job is not to jump and get in their face. Our job is not to hide and let it affect us. Our job is not to, to just cower. Our job is to be the blessing, to forgive them, to let go, and give grace because God gives us grace. So it brings us to the next one. Act on truth, not emotions. The truth is in the word. The truth is in what God is bringing us in the daily text, through our prayers, through our worship, and through our fellowship. We've talked about that before. We must act within what we know is right. We must listen to the Holy Spirit inside of us and not ignore that when someone does something that maybe hurts us or someone does something that makes us not want to be who we are truly, that we need to remember the water on the duck's back. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus has forgiven you of everything you have done, and he has forgiven the people that have wronged you. As Hard as that is sometimes to think about some of the things that happened in our lives or some of the things that are going on in the Capitol right now that right, wrong, and different and where you fall on the political scale, no one's acting right. God's forgiven them. If something maybe happened to you as a child. God's forgiven the person that did that. But you need to, too. You need to let it go because God's Forgiveness is the truth. God's grace, as, as crazy as it sounds, is the only way to starting to accept yourself for who God created you to be. What did Mr. Rogers always teach us? Love your neighbor. And what was God's greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love yourself, how on earth are you going to love your neighbor? And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus has put the blueprint print right here for us to see. This is the truth that should be leading us. This is the truth that should be guiding us each and every day. That we should be out there loving our friends and family, loving the crazy person that cuts you off. That's a tough one for me. <laughs> but, but being accepting, what was it? 
the last time I preached, we did a challenge. I said it was the Lighthouse Challenge. I said, how many of you guys can go get me someone to come into this church by the end of the year? Not just to fill the seats, but because we were trying to extinguish the darkness in Cherokee County. How are y'all doing with that? Yeah, it's great. Thank you. I encourage you to look at Fred Rogers in his neighborhood and us to be an example of being that open, open loving, Christ-like church that will bring anybody and everybody here. We're in a transition. We can't hide it. Fred's retiring. We got a lot of good people that are, have applied, and Scott is meticulously trying to go through and wean them down so we don't have to talk to all of them, and I'm appreciative of that. <laughs> but the reality is, is it doesn't matter. I'm going to say it again. It doesn't matter that Fred is retiring. It doesn't matter because we are the church. We are the neighborhood. We need to love ourselves, and we need to be encouraging others to come because Fred preaching is great. And maybe the next gal or guy, it will be great too. I don't know. But it doesn't matter because what holds us together is that God has given us grace to be together. God has given us grace to be together. So we shall love each other with all our heart. We shall do things for others that we wouldn't necessarily do, like take down moldy drywall for Lou. I wouldn't normally do that, but you know why I did it? Because I love Lou. I do. Whether that's coming and, and I'm watching our kids while I get to go and enjoy my birthday. Why? Because you love my kids. Whether that's going and taking time out of a Sunday to be with kids. Why? Because you love the kids. We love each other. Let's be encouraged by that. Let's do, take a script, take, take something from Mr. Rogers and and be loving of ourselves. Why? Because each and every one of us love each other. And let's go take that and give it to our friends and family that don't feel that love, that don't know that warm embrace of God's hug that we do. Because we've been forgiven of way too much to not forgive others. When you look at that cross, what do you think? That's, that's the grace. That's the thing. Let's not forget, even though Jesus was perfect, he was a human. He had a choice. He had a choice to either die for every one of you and wipe your slate clean of all the things that we have that we hide in our closet that maybe we don't want other people to know about. He did it for you. He could have said no. He could have just accepted and became king of all things when, when on that Palm Sunday and not shaking the turnip cart and, and made people not want to love him and made people uh, want to crucify him because he was saying that he was who he was and the Jewish leaders didn't like that. He made the choice to allow it to happen for you and for your mother and your father and your father's father, your kids and the people of not even born yet. Christ died for sins once and for all a good man on behalf of sinners in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually. Think about it. Would you have the courage to die for all people in that horrible way that he did? I wish I could say yes. Grace gives us as we, have, we, we need to give grace as we receive grace. God gave us that grace, and we need to forgive others, either those in your past or those in the future, but we need to be giving out grace, give out that joy, that warm feeling that we say we feel when we love one another, we need to be giving that out. We need to be giving it out to even the ones that are closest to us. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. But forgiveness is something that if we're not forgiving, we're closing the door to God's love. If we're not taking a step forward, we're taking a step back. There's no in-between. So I encourage you, whatever's on your mind right now, take time 
and forgive. You don't have to call the person and say, I forgive you. I've done that before, and the person said, I didn't even know you were mad at me. And it started a whole new conversation. He's like, you've been mad at me for three years? And I said, well, yeah. You can just forgive, and God knows you did it, and you still get credit. Um, then Peter came to Jesus. You know what? Let's, let's read the whole parable. Let me pull it up. So if you can turn to me, uh, Matthew 18. We'll read the whole parable because it fits perfectly with what we're talking about. Verse 21, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say you, Jesus said to him, I do not say you seven times, but 77 times. It's not literally 77. It's supposed to be a number so large that it's almost infinite that he will continue to do it, and we have to continue to forgive. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Five years' wages is one talent, so lots and lots of money. And he, since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell to his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is not that much money, and seized him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in a prison until he should, could pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported their, to their master all that, that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you of all the debt because you pleaded for me, pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers so he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do it to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Deep stuff. It's not easy to talk about some of the things that might have happened to you. And what I'm talking about, um, I've had many times where I've had withheld forgiveness. Um, I've had many times where maybe I was in the driver's seat and not letting God lead. I can use an example. Before Lorna and I joined the church, everything was a competition. Everything was a competition in our marriage, and it was all about who did what last and who did the other one. You owe me this. You owe me that. And it was not a healthy relationship until we decided that we wanted to let go and let God love. Um, that's when our relationship flourished. There was times where one of my friends wronged me and embarrassed me, and I, like I said, held it for three years. No, in fact, it was six years. Six years I held on to this grudge against my friend, and my friend didn't even know. My friend was mad at someone else's friend, one of my other friends. No clue that I cared. He just thought I just forgot about him. He moved, and we never talked again. I heard a sermon one time here, and I felt like I needed to call him. So I called him out of the blue. I got his number from another friend because I had ignored it. I had deleted him from every social media site. Uh, and I called him. And I uh, 
I asked him how he was, and he said, well, I'm doing great. He had died to himself, accepted Christ, stopped drinking. He had a steady job. His kids were growing, and he was in a great place. I said, that's wonderful. I'm really calling because I'm sorry. And he said, for what? And that's where we had that conversation. And it was difficult for me, and it was super easy for him because he never had a grudge against me. Now, he had to deal with some of the other things, and he, he actually went and made settlements with his other friend that was my friend. And it was, it was hard for me to let go because it was one of my close friends. And it's so easy to hold a grudge against your mom and your dad, so easy to hold a grudge against your friends or your family or your brother and your sister because they're so close to you and you know them so well. It's so easy to push their buttons. It's so easy to know all their quirks and their, their, their insides and their outs. And the devil wants us to do it. He wants us to, to rip our families apart. He doesn't want us to forgive. He wants to extinguish the light. And the only way he can extinguish the light is if we extinguish it for him. Same thing goes back to the lighthouse. So I don't know in your life what you're dealing with. But if I have the slide right. Fred Rogers. Back to Fred Rogers. Forgiveness is is a strange thing. It can sometimes be easier to forgive our enemies than our friends. It can be hardest of all to forgive people we love. Like all of life's important coping skills, the ability to forgive and the capacity to let go of resentments most likely take root very early in our lives. Fred Rogers was a very very smart man. And the more I study him, the more I've been reading some books about his life, I want to be just like him. I want to be just like him because just thinking of the stillness and the calmness that he had. He would wake up every morning at 5 a.m. and pray. Not for himself, but for each and every one of them. After that, he would answer every piece of fan mail. Think about how many he had. He'd answer them by hand to send letters of encouragement to all his friends and family. He never forgot a person that was on the show, and he always loved and cared about every single one of them. He affected millions upon millions of us and still affects us today. His show was built on a platform to deliver the Holy Spirit to you without you even knowing it was happening. And when he left the show, when he left center stage, he was the same person that you met. One time he went on the subway because he was running late, and he didn't think anyone would recognize him, but of course they did. And what did they all do? The entire subway erupted in songs singing, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> there was one time he delivered a commencement speech uh, or a prayer uh, for Boston University. Uh, and when he walked up, all the kids that are graduating erupted into cheering, out of control. The, the president and deans could not calm them down. They were so excited to see Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, who was getting a, a, yet another doctorate from another university as a gift for what he's done for the children. And what did he do? He went up to the podium and said, would you like to sing a song with me? <laughs> and he got every one of those kids to sing, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And then he delivered a very powerful prayer. And I'm actually going to read the same prayer after we're done with this, because it just fits. Sometimes something just fits. And for me right now, my point in my life, I guess I need to watch the Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, maybe with Addie so she can raise her hand. Um, the cool thing about it is it can be in black and white. It could be in color. It still brings people that joy, that love. Why? Because that's what it's built on. So I ask you, today, think about who you need to forgive. Think about how do we love ourselves more. Maybe it's that you need to just accept Christ into your life, fully and honestly, not just 
on the, uh, on the outside, not just on center stage, but when you walk off the stage, you need to accept Christ into that part of your life, like Mr. Rogers. Or maybe it's just that you've been holding on to a grudge and you need to let it go. Because when we, when we take something, we swallow it and we don't let it out, it's been known and scientifically proven that it turns into things like cancer and disease, backaches, problems, problems that can be healed with, with, with healing services or healed with prayer. But we have to be willing to step up and let it go and let God love. So if anything I can encourage you today is you are beautiful the way you're made. The way you are is exactly how God wanted you to be. And he loves you. And he wants you to take that outside and invite people to his neighborhood so he can see all the things and the glory and the, and, and the joy that he intended from your friends and your family. So like any Mr. Rogers would close, can you play the video? Give yourself, forgive others.